and welcome to today's uh, webinar. My name is uh, Jeff Perry. I'm an emergency physician at the Ottawa Hospital and a senior scientist at the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute, where I have an interest in neurovascular emergency research. It is my pleasure to moderate this interesting session on neuromuscular emergencies. Our webinar topic was independently conceived by the Scientific Planning Committee, which comprises of Drs. Eddie Lang, Stacey Kitts, Kirat Gural, and Peter Iraklius, none of whom had any conflicts of interest to declare. My disclosures are as follows. Um, I receive an honorarium for this, uh, from Kate for this moderating session, and I have research grants from the Canadian Institutes for Health Research and the Heart and Stroke Foundation of Ontario. There is uh, some financial support of today's session uh, from the GBS and the CIDP Foundation of Canada in the form of an unrestricted education grant. There's no other conflicts of interest. We've uh, gone to great lengths to mitigate any biases. Um, so the scientific plan committee has mitigated bias by ensuring there's no industry involvement. We've reviewed um, the to, to, with the speakers to disclose any um, potential conflicts of interest. And um, we've also reviewed all the content of the uh, session to make sure there is no uh, bias. So a little background on today's uh, webinar development. So the topics covered tonight are generally less common neurological conditions. They are, however, either very dangerous or significantly debilitating which causes a lot of patient distress. Patients with these conditions often arrive in the emergency department, uh, often as their first point of entry, and these patients often realize that something's very wrong. The diagnostic path and road to proper treatment therefore depends on our ability to make sense of what can be considered a very confusing constellation of signs and symptoms. The goal of this session is to make these diagnoses less confusing and to help you and our patients. Our learning objectives are thus as follows. First, to recognize the key clinical features of neuromuscular conditions presenting to the emergency department, including Guillain-Barre syndrome and myasthenia gravis. To develop an approach to the investigation of patients presenting to the emergency department with a rapidly progressive weakness or acute neuropathy. To discuss emergency management of patients with neuromuscular conditions and finally, to differentiate acute muscle, uh, neuromuscular presentations from functional disorders. To increase the interactivity of this session, we encourage you to use the chat feature and submit your questions as, as you think of your questions. And we will try to address as many of these as we can. We may do so on, uh, as we go through, or we'll do some at the end uh, with uh, the remaining time. We'll also be doing some audience polling near the end of the webinar. And for that, you'll need to have access to the Mentimeter website. You can access uh, this either via the website or by directly by using this QR code. You'll be prompted to enter the, the uh, code if you go in through the website and to answer uh, each question as it comes up. And now with further, no further ado, I'd like to introduce our two speakers tonight. The first speaker is Dr. Miguel Cortel LeBlanc. He's an emergency physician at the Queenswick Carleton Hospital in Ottawa. He completed his Royal College residency program at the University of Ottawa with a focus here in quality improvement. He has a master's, uh, a master's of Health Administration from Dalhousie University. His academic interests include neurological emergencies, departmental and physician efficiency, and medical education. He is an instructor for neurological emergencies at the Royal for the Royal College residents at the University of Ottawa, as well as the Queen's University National Review course. He has previously given talks at CAPE for various neurological emergencies. Our second speaker is Dr. Hans Katzberg, who is a neuro neurologist at the Prosserman Center for Neuromuscular Diseases and a clinical investigator at the Krem Kremble Brain Institute and University Health Network in Toronto. He is an affiliate staff at the Hospital for Sick Children where he runs a neuromuscular transition clinic for young adults and is an associate professor of medicine in neurology and an associate member of the Institute of Medical Sciences at the University of Toronto. Dr. Katzberg's research interests include the assessment and treatment of neuropathies 
muscle cramps, and neuromuscular junction disorders, including myasthenia gravis. So now I will turn things over to Dr. Cortell. Miguel. Thanks, Jeff. I'm just gonna open this up here. Welcome everyone again. I'm very excited for our discussion tonight. And as mentioned, um, uh, there are uh, very few conflict of interest to disclose, especially on my end. I am receiving an honor honorarium from CAPE for speaking tonight. Uh, and the talk has been funded by an education grant uh, from the GBS and CIDP Foundation of Canada. Other than that, uh, there are no potential biases that, um, that on my end that we identified. And we'll just delve right in. I want to start by uh, thinking and discussing with you a case that I saw in the emergency room about a year ago. Uh, and it was a case of uh, a lady, we'll call her Emma, who had traveled to the Caribbean. It was her first time going there. And she developed a diarrheal illness. And when she came back to Canada, she presented it to the emergency department with nausea, vomiting, and leg weakness. And she presented twice to the ED was given fluids, nausea medications, and sent home. And it was only in her third visit when she came in that her legs were too weak and too unsteady that she was ultimately diagnosed with GBS. So the peripheral nervous system disorders and neuromuscular disorders present in a huge spectrum. And as a result, it can make it uh, a major puzzle for physicians to be able to uh, piece together where the disorder is being localized. And that's part of what we're gonna be discussing today when we talk about peripheral nervous system disorders. We're gonna be trying to increase your confidence in diagnosing these and in initiating management. For my portion of the talk, uh, we'll go through a brief introduction on the peripheral nervous system terminology and localization, and then we'll go through a few cases of, of some select peripheral nervous system disorders. There's gonna be a portion halfway through and about two thirds through for questions that I'll answer as, as they've collected. And then we'll go through a Q&A at the end as well. So note on terminology, uh, peripheral nervous system disorders are named according to the location of where the lesion uh, takes place. If it's in the spinal cord, it's termed a myelopathy. In the nerve root, it's a radiculopathy. In the plexus, it's a plexopathy. At the level of the peripheral nerve, it's a peripheral neuropathy. At the neuromuscular junction, it's a neuromuscular junction disorder. And at the muscle, it's a myopathy. And these can also be classified as to how the patient's sensory, uh, sensory motor deficits um, uh, present, whether they're symmetrical or asymmetrical. Symmetrical uh, sensory motor deficits can be divided into demyelinating disorders or toxic and metabolic disorders. And asymmetrical disorders can be divided into radiculopathies or plexopathies, isolated mononeuropathies, mononeuritis multiplex, motor neuron disorders, and ganglionopathies. What is particularly useful is using these five features to try to distinguish whether a patient's sensory motor deficits is likely central or from an upper motor neuron versus a lower motor neuron lesion. In upper motor neuron lesions, the reflexes are increased, tones increased, there is usually no atrophy or fasciculations, and a Babinski's can be present. And the opposite findings um, are present when it's a lower, lower motor neuron lesion. So we'll start off with a case here. This is a 35-year-old woman who presented to the emergency department with a past medical history of injection drug use and complaining of progressive right shoulder and arm pain and fevers. On exam, she has numbness to her shoulder, the lateral aspect of her forearm, her thumb, and she's weak in her elbow, elbow flexion, and her wrist extension. I want you to reflect on these three questions. And, uh, and as uh, Dr. Perry mentioned, feel free to um, write some of the answers uh, in the chat. Think about what is the most concerning cause of this patient's symptoms. List three of the most important investigations that you want to start immediately in the emergency room. And where in the nervous system is this patient's lesion or disorder localized? So radiculopathies are disorders at the level of the nerve root, like in the case of a disc herniation that impinges on the nerve root. 
and they can be uh, typically uh, localized using something like the Asia Spine Exam, which is a standardized, a standardized way of uh, localizing uh, nerve root disorders. They're lo localized to one nerve root and a sensory deficit can precede motor deficits at times. And they should be suspected if the patient is complaining of axial or radicular pain, if there's dermatomal sensory loss, or if the weakness it follows a myotomal pattern. There's many causes for these. Most commonly, we will see this herniation or spondylosis. However, we must be cautious to not miss epidural abscesses, metastases, or other sinister causes like an epidural hematoma. So in summary for this case, this is an example of an epidural abscess in this patient with uh, fevers and risk factors presenting with radicular uh, pain. Uh, it would be diagnosed on MRI. Blood culture should also be ordered as well as inflammatory markers. And in her case, it was localized to the C5 and C6 nerve roots. With that, we'll move on to the second case. Here's a 40 year old man who's presenting with six weeks of symptoms. He's, he initially had acute onset right upper extremity pain. It radiated from his shoulder to his hand. And on exam, he had weak shoulder ex external rotation, form pronation, thumb flexion, and index finger flexion. He had atrophy over his deltoids, his forearm extensors, and his thinner muscles. So in thinking, in, in looking at this presentation here, think about what is the most likely cause of this patient's uh, symptoms. What is the most important investigation needed to confirm your diagnosis? And where in the nervous system this patient's lesion is or, or disorder is localized? Plexopathies are... Uh, are disorders that are localized to the plexi in the body. There's four main ones, the cervical plexus, the brachial plexus, the lumbar plexus, and the sacral plexus. And they're usually characterized by having mixed deficits that can appear patchy. They localize to a site of compression at the plexus, um, but they're beyond one single peripheral nerve and they don't isolate to any one nerve root. Like radiculopathies, there's many causes for these, and uh, most textbooks would divide them into either open or closed injuries. Open injuries include things like penetrating trauma. Most often in the emergency room, we will see closed injuries like traction injuries, radiation, neoplastic processes, and idiopathic uh, uh, plexitis. This picture depicts what was uh, described in the case given. So this is an example of atrophy, asymmetric atrophy over the lateral aspect of this gentleman's muscle group in the upper extremity. And it's a case of idiopathic brachial plexitis or neurologic amyotrophy. It's characterized with sudden severe pain, patchy weakness, often involving the shoulder external rotation, form pronation, thumb flexion, and index fingers flexion, and atrophy of those muscle groups. It's diagnosed clinically primarily. And MRI brachial plexus can be supportive, as well as neuroconduction studies and EMG. Ultimately, the management of, uh, of this condition is physiotherapy, and there might be a role of tapering steroids and uh, neuropathic analgesics. So in summary for this case, this is an example of neurologic amyotrophy or idiopathic brachial plexitis. MRI pla brachial plexus would be indicated, and the, the patient's lesion is localized at the brachial plexus, hence his patchy distribution that does not isolate to one uh, peripheral nerve or nerve root. I'll take a moment there, uh, Dr. Perry, if there are any questions that have, um, that have accumulated, I'm happy to address any. Um, I don't see any questions as of yet, um, but uh, if you do have questions, please um, put them into the uh, chat and we will uh, answer them as they uh, come up and certainly, if not at the end of the uh, talk. Okay, perfect. We'll move on to this case. This is a, a case of a 55 year old woman who's presenting with left hand weakness. She fell asleep on a chair while intoxicated and her resting hand position is as depicted here. This is a frequent presentation in our emergency rooms. Where in the nervous system is this patient's lesion localized? And what is the most common entrapment site that can lead to this injury? So mononeuropathies can be divided as to whether there's a motor deficit, sensory deficit, or a combination of both of them. In the upper extremities, the most common entrapment site for the radial nerve is the axilla. 
for the median nerve is the carpal tunnel, and for the ulnar nerve is the elbow. In the lower extremity, the most common nerve involved is the perineal nerve, and it's usually entrapped at the fibular head. There are some clues in the patient's presentation that can uh, alert you to where to which nerve is involved with regards to resting hand positions. A radial nerve palsy presents with a, with a rest drop of the hand. Median nerve palsy presents with monkey hand. And ulnar nerve palsy, this should read ulnar nerve, presents with claw hand. So for this patient, the, the lesion is localized to the radial nerve. And this was, uh, the clue here was her wrist drop. And the most common entrapment site would be the axilla. Okay, we'll move on to a more involved case. Here's a 35 year old man who's presenting, feeling unsteady. His vital signs are shown here. They're normal except for his tachycardia. And on exam, his lower extremities are quite weak. His sensation is normal and his reflexes in his lower extremities are decreased. For this patient, what would be the most common, the most likely diagnosis, and what are four infections that are associated with this disorder? So GBS is a group of heterogeneous disorders of the peripheral nerves that are characterized with an acute onset. They're symmetrical, and they typically have a monophasic course. Four of the main types of uh, the GBS disorders uh, include AIDP which is the classic form of GBS that we see in the uh, most often in the emergency room. This is acute inflammatory demyelinating polar neuropathy. But there's also some more sinister uh, types that have uh, often a more severe protracted course, including the acute motor axonal neuropathy type, the motor sensory axonal neuropathy, and Miller-Fisher syndrome. For AIDP, or the classic form of GBS, Antibodies are targeting the myelin sheets of uh, neurons, causing demyelination and therefore slowing down axonal conduction. It's important to highlight that more than 70% of patients with GBS will present with autonomic disturbances as well. Most commonly tachycardia, but it can be urinary retention, hypertension or hypotension, pileus or anhydrosis. NINS has a diagnostic criteria in, uh, to help us in making this diagnosis. Two features that are necessary to make this diagnosis are progressive weakness of at least one limb and a hyporeflexia. Both of these are needed. There are other features that can cast doubt as to whether GBS is the main diagnosis. These include marked asymmetry in the findings, severe bladder bowel dysfunction at onset, persistence of bladder bowel dysfunction, a sharp sensory level, a CSF with more than 50 leukocytes, and central signs, except for the case of Miller-Fisher syndrome. It's important to think about whether there's any role for MRI, in particular MRI of the spine. And the role for MRI in the spine is in, in, in cases where they have some of these features that can cast out on the diagnosis, cases where there could still be an acute spinal cord syndrome and urgent MRI would be indicated. In many patients, the diagnosis of GBS will be quite clear. Lumbar puncture can be supportive for the diagnosis. The finding here is album albinocytologic dissociation, which involves increasing in, increase in the CSF protein without an increase in the Y count. In fact, if the Y count is greater than 50, an altered diagnosis uh, should be considered. With regards to treatment of GBS, IVAG and PLEX have been, have been compared extensively in the literature. And there's Cochrane label data suggests that the benefits are similar with regards to improvements in disability. And the adverse events between both of these, simil uh, these therapies is also similar. They're basically clinically equivalent. The main difference is, is in what the benefits are of both of these treatments. IVIG is easier to administer, it is more available, and it's also better tolerated in patients with hemodynamic fluctuations. Whereas plasma exchange has randomized control data uh, showing benefit up to four weeks, whereas the data for IVIG has been demonstrated for up to two weeks. It does not mean that there's no benefit uh, of IVIG beyond two weeks. It just means that the, the limits of the outcomes of the data has been uh, up to two weeks. Steroids have also been looked at uh, extensively. And here there is uh, Cochrane level data suggesting that uh, steroids are associated with more harm 
In summary, a patient with GBS in the ED should be admitted often to the ICU, depending on the presentation. Uh, if there are predictors of respiratory failure, they should be intubated and I, they should have a full course of IVIG. There's no role for steroids. They should have optimal supportive care and often rehabilitation. In summary for this case, the most likely diagnosis is AIDP or the classic form of GBS. And a few infections associated with this disorder include Campylobacter, Mycoplasma, CMV, EBV, Influenza, and Zika. So this case uh, evolves a little bit. The same patient is now uh, appearing more drowsy. His GCS is 13 and he's complaining of difficulty swallowing. I want you to think of five predictors of requiring mechanical ventilation in patients presenting with GBS and describe one tool to predict prognosis in patients with GBS. One of the challenges in the ED is uh, our reliance on pulse oximetries in helping us assess who might need uh, ventilatory support. But pulse oximetry is not, uh, is not usually a useful tool for GBS. The issue is not hypoxia, is neuromuscular weakness. There are many features that have been elicited to predict respiratory failure. The ones with the most evidence include a rapid course, neck weakness, bulbar weakness, facial weakness, autonomic dysfunction. And there are others that we can discuss in the QA as well, but I, I want you to remember that these are the ones that have the, the, the largest body of evidence supporting them. One validated tool in predicting ventilation is the egress tool. It has three different uh, features. One of them is the days from onset, the presence of facial or bulbar weakness, and the, the strength of the muscle groups, the MRC sum score. Um, the way that the MRC sum score is calculated, most of you would actually be familiar with this, even though you might not be aware that it's called the MRC sum score, is the, what you do is you grade the muscle strength from zero to five, as you usually would, but you select the, the, these three main muscle groups in the upper extremity and in the lower extremity. So, so shoulder abduction, elbow flexion, wrist extension, hip flexion, knee extension, and foot dorsiflexion, and you total them. And this is readily available in an online tool. So in summary, five predictors of requiring mechanical ventilation in GBS include a rapid course, neck weakness, bulbar weakness, facial weakness, and autonomic dysfunction. And one tool that can predict the prognosis in patients with GBS is the egress uh, tool. Dr. Perry, before I move on, are there any questions that uh, I should take up? I have just one more case. Sure. There's uh, a couple of questions here. First one is, any recommendations on how to differentiate between peripheral nerve versus radiculopathy? For example, weakness in, with elbow flexion. Is it neuromusculocutaneous uh, or C5? Thank you. So uh, sometimes there could be overlap between the two. Uh, but usually a nerve root will, uh, will uh, involve more than one muscle group. So a C5 lesion would involve muscles that are involving beyond just bicep flexion, whereas a peripheral nerve will usually involve that single muscle group. All right. And the uh, case number three, why entrapment of the axilla while drunk? The... Um, the, that, that is uh, sort of like a typical story that's used for Royal College exams, but we do see it in DD. The, the, what happens is that when patients pass out or they fall asleep or they faint and they have their, their arm extended over a surface and the, that surface, the couch or the chair is entrapping onto the axilla, often an intoxicated patient can result in entrapment of the nerve. All right, great. Um, I'll let you continue on there. Okay, so uh, this is the last case that I have. Here's a 35-year-old man who's presenting with double vision and unsteadiness. He has diplopia, ataxia, and areflexia after a recent viral illness. And on exam, this is what you notice from his... Go all the way function. down. Go all the way to the right. 
look all the way to the left, look all the way up, look straight ahead, look up, look down, look right, look left, look straight. In case anybody had challenges with sound there, the instructor is asking the patient to move in each of the directions. And here he's been asked to do a finger to nose test with, uh, with a pen. Okay. Look all the way down. So for this patient, what is the most likely diagnosis? And list two reasons that a neuromuscular junction etiology is unlikely in this patient. And that second part, you will be better equipped to answer it after the, the second talk today as well. Miller-Fisher syndrome is the most common minor GBS variant. It's characterized by the triad of ophthalmoplegia, ataxia, and reflexia. And it can also have bulbar symptoms or cranial nerve involvement. For patients that present with an overlap between GBS symptoms and Miller-Fisher syndrome, we, uh, we say that they have Miller-Fisher syndrome overlap syndrome. And for those that present with ovular symptoms, overlap symptoms between Miller-Fisher and Bickerstaff encephalitis, uh, we term this Miller-Fisher syndrome related disorder. On this note, Big Bickerstaff encephalitis has the shared features of Miller-Fisher in that it, it presents with ophthalmoplegia and ataxia. However, the, the, um, the, there's usually hyperreflexia with uh, Bickerstaff encephalitis and the level of consciousness can be severely affected. So for this gentleman, the most likely diagnosis with Miller-Fisher syndrome and the two reasons that a neuromuscular junction etiology is unlikely are his areflexia and his ataxia. With this, I'm happy to open it for questions. So thank you, Miguel. Um, so there's a, a couple more questions. So one is uh, with, with uh, GBS, how do you easily evaluate bulbar weakness? And I'd even suggest we take it one step back or further and say, to, can you just describe what you mean uh, when you say bulbar weakness, what exactly do you mean? Yeah, so uh, patients that present with, uh, I want, uh, when you think bulbar, think about, just to put it simply, think about your oropharynx, your swallow, your tongue, um, all the things that protect your secretions and your airway. For patients that present with weakness of these muscle groups, you should be worried. Um, the, so tongue weakness can be, uh, can be assessed. You can also ask them to puff up your cheeks, although that is more typical for, um, for myopathies or neur neuromuscular disorders. Um, but if, uh, a few pearls that are very useful for GBS patients are checking for neck flexion or neck extension weakness by actually using your hand against resistance and, um, a, a single breath count. So asking patients to take a big breath in. And then count out one, two, three, four, five, and you can you can test this yourself. And everybody here, I assume, will probably get over twenty. If you can't get over twenty, you should be worried. And sometimes these patients can only count to nine or ten. And that's a quick bedside uh, test that you can use uh, that can alert you to significant weakness um, or or bulbar weakness. But you answered the next question in that one. So that's great. So um, thank you very much, uh, Miguel. With that, I think we'll um, sort of change um, gears here a bit and we'll go, hand things over to Dr. Katzberg. If you have questions for uh, uh, Dr. Cortel Leblanc, um, please keep uh, adding them to the chat and we'll try and get to them at the end. Yes, hello. My name is uh, Hans Katzberg and uh, very happy to... Uh, do the second part of this talk. And uh, I think uh, hopefully it will be a nice supplement uh, to Dr. Uh, Cortel's uh, lecture. Here are my disclosures. Uh, there are a number of um, relations I, I have with industry as well as research grants. And there will be some discussion on uh, some of these treatments as we have uh, at our group been involved in uh, some of this research on uh, immunoglobulin particularly, and also some of the oral agents that I will be talking about. And that's listed here in detail. And as mentioned earlier, these, uh, the talk is also supported by a 
uh, grant support from this GBSCIDP Foundation of Canada, who we work uh, very closely with, it's a great patient advocacy group, and we will uh, make all efforts to mitigate uh, bias. So I will start with a case, but I will only do one case, and it will be a polling case. So I will ask for everyone's input. Uh, this is a case of a 58-year-old man presenting with generalized fatigable weakness in the limbs over a period of eight weeks without sensory complaints at all, difficulty managing with work and daily activities. Examination reveals normal sensation in all dermatomes, all modalities, slightly hypoactive reflexes. Now, this is the extent of the, the, the case, and I've left it vague like this on purpose. And here are the selections, and we'll open the polling in a second, but uh, the reason I selected these conditions is because we will be focusing in on one of these conditions for the remainder of the talk, and there is really not a lot of time to go into detail into, any, into all the other conditions that are listed there. Um, however, it does provide an opportunity to do a preamble and discuss a little bit about, about each of these, which could present in this, in this way. So I think it, rather than asking which is the most likely presentation, I've asked the inverse. So this is multiple sclerosis, inflammatory myositis, ALS or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, mycena gravis, and CIDP, for those of you not familiar with CIDP, essentially it's the chronic form of Guillain-Barre syndrome. So with that, I will open the polling now. And uh, there is a bit of a delay, so I will wait until we have some significant uh, numbers. And I will open the voting here. There we go. So it's now coming in, so I will wait for a little while until we get a number of uh, responses and then we will move forward. So if you are able to log into the app uh, and to the network, um, please feel free to provide your answers. Okay, we have eight responses. I will wait a little bit longer. And again, uh, the text is a little small. Uh, it's multiple sclerosis, inflammatory myositis, ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, myasthenia gravis, CIDP or the chronic form of Guillain-Barre syndrome. And the presentation was a man with progressive weakness over eight weeks leading to functional disability no sensory complaints or findings on the examination and slightly hypoactive reflexes, but they're still elicitable. Okay, 10 responses. And if I don't see any more coming in, I will move forward for the sake of time. So there's a, more, a few more coming in. Okay, I will move forward. Close the voting and next slide. So there's a number of different, as I mentioned, really, I left it vague because there is not really any um, hard and fast uh, answer to this question, but all five of these conditions, I think it provides an opportunity to, to review that all five of these conditions could present with generalized weakness. Uh, and there's some subtle aspects to the examination that might lead you in one direction or the other and aspects on the history. So I'll go over that now, and then we will move forward to focus in on the condition, of, uh, uh, one condition for the rest of the talk. And that will be myasthenia gravis. And I put the word fatigability in there on purpose. Uh, if, if perhaps the most likely um, condition, uh, I think many of you might add, might have uh, responded as myasthenia gravis. However, it's important to note that fatigability can be a feature of any neurological condition, including MS, including uh, CIDP. Uh, but it's characterized as one of the key features of myasthenia gravis. So perhaps, if, again, if I asked the most likely, that would be the answer. But conditions um, of the nerve and in terms of peripheral syndromes and centrally in terms of central demyelinating syndromes, these usually will have sensory complaints or findings and some sort of reflex change. So in MS, this might be hyperactive reflexes or other upper motor neuron signs. And in uh, Guillain-Barre or CIDP, these might be hypoactive or missing. Now, one might ask why, why not CIDP then if these were slightly hypoactive? Uh, usually the reflexes are more prominently hypoactive to, to completely missing. This is a key feature in GBS as well. However, in GBS, 
sometimes this uh, can be delayed. So uh, not always present right away. And the reason uh, also I put eight weeks on there is that uh, the four week mark is usually what we refer to uh, trying to dis uh, trying to identify Guillain-Barre syndrome. Once it gets past eight weeks, you might be going into CIDP, but usually these patients have some form of sensory complaints and more prominent hyporeflexia. So that's why those might be less likely. I mentioned ALS and certainly this can pre present symmetrically, but most present asymmetrically. Um, so usually one hand becoming weak, then progressing into a more um, stepwise decline in strength. And usually there's other additional features, usually hyperreflexia, uh, spasticity or spastic speech. And in the end stages, sometimes the reflexes can be lost, but this is usually a feature early on. And lower motor neuron signs, so cramps can be a prominent uh, symptom there, not specific, but uh, a common symptom and fasciculations, of course. Again, something we do a lot in terms of counseling patients um, that do not have ALS because fasciculations is a common symptom, but they can be uh, a prominent symptom in, in ALS. The early presence of, there's another comment about these cases, the early presence of cranial nerve abnormalities, ocular or bulbar can also help distinguish myopathy from MG. So again, myositis perhaps could be a consideration here, but usually ocular and bulbar symptoms are most prominent in uh, myasthenia gravis. So one of the uh, priorities in terms of the objectives was talking a little bit about functional uh, versus organic weakness. Now, again, I don't have time to go over all the aspects of functional uh, neurology because this depends on the condition. However, um, in, when it comes to weakness, the main component is the, the aspect of giveaway weakness. So an inconsistent, um, shaky, kind of a non-smooth weakness uh, is, is more likely to be a functional versus organic weakness. And there's a number of other clinical techniques that can be used, not relevant necessarily to a lot of these neuromuscular conditions that are more symmetric bilateral, but if there is unilateral weakness, for example, the most one of the most famous signs is the Hoover sign depicted here in the bottom left. And that is trying to assess patient's effort. So you put your hand under the leg that you're not testing, you ask the patient to lift the contralateral leg and you should feel some pressure uh, because it requires some contralateral anchoring to be able to lift the, the contralateral leg. And if you do not feel that pressure or that effort, then perhaps the patient is not putting in all the effort and that is called Hoover sign. And that is one of many, many functional uh, neurological signs. Uh, and perhaps the best thing I can do is refer you to a great website called neurosymptoms.org um, this is run by a neurologist in Scotland who's really become the world expert on functional weakness. And there's a host of free uh, tools and reviews on there. Just an example uh, from his website is, is on the right there. So I would encourage everyone to use that resource. So now let's dive into the most likely cause of this um, uh, patient's presentation and patients with fatigable weakness. And then how do we distinguish myasthenia between, uh, between myasthenia and other, other conditions? Um, uh, so by learning a little bit about MG, we can learn to distinguish and also we'll go into a little bit about management because this is also uh, critical. So my senior is char character, uh, characterized by fatigability. As I mentioned earlier, this occurs mostly in the ocular uh, muscles uh, causing diplopia. Ptosis or droopy eyelids is common early. You can see that in the panel on the right here, the ptosis. Facial weakness is also prominent. The limbs uh, also have fatigable weakness. This usually affects the proximal more than distal upper and lower extremities. However, this, uh, there can also be fatigable weakness in the hands, particularly if, uh, with, with uh, increased use. For example, uh, people writing exams, typing, writing, uh, all of these can fatigue uh, the upper extremity hands, for example. Neck and axial weakness is, is a, a, a not only a Common symptom, but uh, also concerning symptom. Uh, as uh, Dr. Cortel Blank mentioned in GBS, this is also a, a herald of uh, uh, perhaps of uh, a crisis. And this happens to be the case in myasthenia as well. Bulbar weakness can occur, chewing, swallowing, speech difficulties, which usually has a nasal pattern. And there also can be respiratory disturbances and sleep apnea is more prevalent in myasthenia as well. The other key, in addition to fatigability is variability. And uh, this is usually characterized by worse symptoms at the end of the day. 
Reflexes, sensation, and coordination are usually spared, but as you recall from the case, if you have significant weakness, sometimes your reflexes can be slightly hypoactive, which was the issue in the case. So how do we assess fatigability in myasthenia gravis? So what we like to do in our clinic, and we've done a lot of work on this over the years to validate this and, and check this in hundreds of patients. Um, and generally what we, the approach we use, we like timed tests. Now you can do repetitive um, activation of certain muscles. So get someone to bring their arms up and then repetitively trying to give some resistance, but there's really not a lot of good standardization to that in terms of the effort and the amount of time done. So we like time tests because they tend to be a bit more um, uh, consistent because the patient is uh, using their, their selves as their own internal control um, and using their own gravity. So we use three minutes of abduction in the arms, 90 seconds of hip flexion in the supine position, and 60 seconds of neck flexion in the supine position as well. What about ocular signs? The medial rectus is most often involved. You have diplopia and ptosis that can also occur with up gaze and lateral gaze. We use about a minute in, the, in these positions to see if the um, symptoms develop or if you can visibly see some of this. Kogan's lit twitch sign is a sign where you actually have the patient look down and then look to the primary gaze and you see a brief twitch of the eyelid um, in, in the side that has the ptosis. Um, due to Herring's law and also alternating ptosis. So that is someone has ptosis on the right and then a few weeks later or a few days later, it may switch to the other side. That's very unusual in other neuromuscular and other neurological conditions, but it's quite a almost pathognomonic sign in myasthenia gravis. Very few other conditions that do that. You can, uh, there was a question earlier about how do I assess bulbar weakness I saw in the chat. So this is very difficult to do, but um, even during your evaluation, you're speaking to the patient for a period of time, you may be able to detect fatigable speech. Um, and then I also like to uh, stress the patient out a little bit in the clinic. And I do have them often do 20 squats. Now, the problem here is this is not a very uh, useful sign if there's other confounders, patients uh, may be overweight or have knee issues or other limits. But if someone can do it, it's very helpful to exclude. Now, you might think 20 squats is a lot. Uh, patients will tire out, but it, I use it more as a, as a rule out type of test because uh, in someone with myasthenia, this is very challenging. What about MG mimics? So because there can be ocular signs, it's important to not miss uh, central uh, neurological uh, symptoms like uh, brainstem lacunar strokes can sometimes present like this or have dysphagia. There's certain muscular dystrophies that can also have a lot of swallowing symptoms in ocular, which are what we see in MG. Uh, but this is quite rare. Blepharospasm can also uh, look like ptosis, uh, but, but be a mimic. And it's important to recognize that there's other causes of fatigue. So iron deficiency, B12, sleep disturbances, thyroid dis, uh, dysfunction, functional disorders, and even depression. So this is what we spend a lot of time doing in our large myasthenia clinic is trying to use our other tools, but just even clinically trying to evaluate for this. And also important to remember the other reason we're diving in a, li a little bit on MG, it's it's not necessarily, it's considered technically in terms of prevalence or rare disease, but you may see a lot of MG patients coming through the emergency room and they often have uh, exacerbations. So it's important in, in our clinic as well to recognize that patients with MG can also get other things like iron deficiency, B12, et cetera, thyroid disorders. They're, and in fact, um, some of these have common immune mechanisms that may be a little more prevalent in MG. So how do you diagnose MG, so certainly I, I didn't put electrophysiology on there because that's what I do. Uh, of course, this is difficult to do in the emergency room. So I'm putting all the tests that perhaps in the emergency room could be considered. Uh, Tensilon is IV edrophonium. This used to be used uh, years ago, but it's not even available in Ontario. And I'm at an MG meeting right now, actually. And you know, I've learned that it's also not available in other places like in the UK. At, um, in the US, it is available. But the problem there is monitoring required. Uh, there can be prominent bradycardia and really has fallen out of favor as well in uh, many MG groups. Uh, mestinon test is an alternative. Mestinon uh, is a uh, oral, longer acting version of the um, uh, tensilon, which acts to boost the acetylcholine in the junction. And this takes about 30 to 60 minutes to work, but practically may be difficult to access and get dispensing in the emergency room through the pharmacy and then get this uh, uh, on a new patient anyway. So practically it can be a challenge. An ice test uh, can be used really for ptosis, improvement of ptosis. So really the, the concept there is that the cold temperature improves neuromuscular junction transmission. So that could be useful and practical. 
but not really helpful for any other symptoms, including diplopia. And you can send MG antibodies in uh, uh, really many places around the country. We sent to the lab in UBC, which has uh, most of the available antibodies. This is to avoid having to send it necessarily to the US. And they also do more sensitive assays and look for two extra antibodies that could be positive and relevant in MG that are not the acetylcholine receptor antibodies. So that's something to consider. Imaging may be relevant here because uh, myasthenia can be associated with thymic enlargement or even thymic tumor. So that may be a helpful test. You can see this sometimes on, C, on chest x-ray as well, but a CT certainly is more sensitive. And there's also a role for removal of the thymus if there is a tumor. And even in young patients, there's a role even if there is not a tumor. Uh, I'll allude to this later, but uh, small cell lung cancer can also be um, associated with Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome. I, that's even a more rare disease. So I'm not gonna spend much time on that, but uh, another role perhaps for considering chest imaging. And going back to the case, we didn't tell you about CK in that case, but I think that could be a useful test to distinguish muscle disease like myositis or myopathy from myasthenia where the CK uh, is usually normal, uh, similar in other nerve conditions. So what about some management issues? So uh, patients are usually immunosuppressed. I'll mention that in a second. So avoiding infection is important. Exercise um, should be, uh, so exercise caution with antibiotics and supplements. I'll mention the list in a second. We think vaccinations are safe in MG. We've done some work on this, uh, even with the COVID vaccine, with the exception perhaps of live attenuated vaccines. But these are not very often used, including the shingles vaccine, for example, or nasal, uh, the older shingle vaccine or the nasal uh, form of the flu vaccine. Good sleep, hygiene and napping can be helpful as well. I think it's important to remember that there's some drugs that can exacerbate my scene. And this borrowed a few slides from Dr. Cortel Blank because they were just so great. This is one of them. Uh, just to kind of remember, group this into categories, cardiovascular, antibiotics, and other. Um, think rapid AFib meds. I think that's a great way to remember that. Beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, amongst others. Certain antibiotics, particularly the aminoglycosides. And phenytoin neuromuscular blockers I'll mention in a second. Corticosteroids is on the list, but really that is only with very high doses of steroids. So really the old literature where people would use for myasthenia over 100 milligrams of prednisone. Uh, and sometimes that could cause a paradoxical worsening because as I'll mention, we use um, steroids often in the management of MG. In terms of paralytic agents, succinylcholine is uh, uh, not as preferred as rocuronium, for example. That is based on some of the sensitivity, hypersensitivity that can occur in the postsynaptic junction in, uh, that's destroyed or affected in MG. So it causes a, a hypersensitivity to succinylcholine and a less predictable response. Dr. Cortel Blanc mentioned um, the predictors of crisis to GBS, and this is often similar to what we use in MG. And one other test that might be helpful in addition to the counting test is at FBC bedside. We do this in the clinic, um, or you can get RT perhaps uh, to help. And usually use the same marker that we do in many conditions neurologically of uh, 20 milliliters per kilogram. If you think of a 70 kilogram person, that's about 1.4 liters. So we use that as a kind of a rough marker. Certainly below one liter is a concern. Again, you've seen this slide on PLEX versus IVIG in terms of the emergency management, and you saw the benefits. Uh, we've done a lot of these uh, pivotal studies actually early on, so I won't go into detail on them, but uh, this is also helpful and, and proven for myasthenia, both IVIG and plasmapheresis, and we've actually done studies, this is from our group, showing that these are equivalent, and there's some uh, advantages to one over the other as, as has been discussed previously. Here are some of the medicines that are used for the management of MG, not necessarily because I want you to focus on each one individually, but these may be what people are already coming in on if you're managing or seeing patients in the emergency department that all have similar, uh, the similar approach in that they suppress the immune system and, and help with MG. So I won't go over them in detail, but these are the same that you see for, for other immune conditions with the exception of the top agent, pyridostigmine, uh, which I mentioned earlier, mestinon, and this really is used for, for just symptomatic treatment, not the immune therapy. So you may have heard of cholinergic crisis. Now, mesinon or pyridostigmine does, can cause this, but it's quite rare these days because patients are, unless they intentionally try to overdose on this, uh, usually the dosage is not enough to cause that. But I think um, the conditions that 
you may encounter certainly more in the emergency setting that we do than we do in the outpatient clinic would be things like organophosphate toxicity uh, with pesticides and other agents uh, or laratoxin spider bites in rare cases. And these work um, by causing cholinergic crisis through different mechanisms. The organophosphates by interfering with the acetylcholinesterase enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine, so too much acetylcholine, and um, or the laratoxin, which causes too much calcium influx and again leads to too much acetylcholine release. And I won't go over all the, the details on the muscarinic and nicotinic side effects, but here's a couple of mnemonics, sludge BBB in the days of the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, uh, Saturday, Sunday, in terms of some of the symptoms that you might see and, uh, and accompanied also with weakness. Just a couple of words of, uh, on a couple of other disorders, Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome. So uh, this can also cause weakness um, but in contrast to myasthenia, it's really considered quite a little bit of a different disease. First of all, it's quite much more rare than MG. Usually there is areflexia in this condition as well as ataxia and autonomic dysfunction. So this is a bit different and it's treated a bit different also with immunotherapy, but there's other agents that can be helpful and, and sometimes can be associated with small cell lung cancer. That's why I mentioned the CT in the cases of weakness uh, and treating the underlying cancer if it's associated with that is the, the treatment of choice. In other neuromuscular junction disorders, botulism. Um, so this causes a descending paralysis and also can have autonomic symptoms. And the challenge here is that identifying, and sorry, in terms of uh, anticholinergic symptoms, more specifically would be things like uh, pupillary changes or hypersalivation. And the challenge here is that it's not easy to confirm this diagnosis. Really, you need an antitoxin from stool or a wound source, for example, but I've been through this before and doing that test actually requires you to, um, someone to put the toxin in an animal and that takes about a week. So and this is obviously a, an urgent treatment. Uh, so usually if you're strongly considering this, uh, you will consider the antitoxin treatment early. However, it's not an easy decision because it's very expensive. So certainly that would be a role to, if you're really strongly suspicious of that to contact uh, neurology or someone. So just in conclusion, uh, of course, it's not going to be easy to summarize everything, but just the bottom line is to look for hard neurological signs that I alluded to in the first few slides, true fatigability, and I told you a little bit about perhaps try to try to measure that when assessing progressive weakness. Consider myasthenia gravis as well as Guillain barre that um, Dr. Cortel Barnt mentioned, as well as the botulism. These are treatable and urgent, and supportive therapy can be helpful not only in GBS, um, uh, sorry, in immunomodulation, not only in GBS, but also in myasthenia. So there's some commonalities there. So a number of questions in the chat about radiculopathies versus mononeuropathies. This is one of the most common questions I've gotten in the last 20 years. Uh, and uh, to the point that I was saying the same thing over and over, and there's not really any good book on that. So I published a, a review article, uh, pedagogy actually. So just an approach to that with tables, uh, C5 versus musculocutaneous, C6 versus radial, et cetera. So if someone is interested in that, uh, you can look up this title, Distinguishing Radiculopathies from Mononeuropathies. And uh, if you're really interested in a, a, a full chapter on a bit more chronically developing weakness, um, there's a chapter in this book, Neuromuscular Disorders of Symptoms and Signs Approach. So with that, I will exit and happy to take questions. Great, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kasper. Um, so we do have a, a question. Um, one of the questions uh, here, I'm sorry, is how often do you see antibodies in MG and how long do these take to come back? Yeah, I was debating whether I should put, the, put that in uh, to the slide because it does take a number of weeks. Um, so it will not necessarily affect your immediate management but uh, it could make a significant impact on the patient if it is, if you are able to send them because the diagnosis could come earlier. I think average time to MG diagnosis can be significantly delayed. So I think that's something to consider, but uh, the sensitivity for generalized myasthenia is in the order of uh, 80 to 90%, depending on the assay. Um, so it's a it's fairly sensitive test. Um, so for um, Miguel, there is a question. In patients in whom we expect, expect um, GBS or similar presentations, assuming stability, what is the urgency of consultation? In particular, they're thinking of how fast they need to transfer them to tertiary care. 
So <clears throat> the there's a there's a, a huge spectrum in how patients with GPS present. Uh, to highlight the the case that I started the talk with, uh, the woman who presented to the ED three times, she's not someone that would need to be, you know, to be transferred to a tertiary care center urgently. Uh, but another patient who you're noticing that they're they're having a very rapid course, that they're getting weak, if there's any breathing conditions, uh, you need to frame that in your mind as a rapidly uh, evolving um, emergency, and they would need to be transferred. Uh, Urgently, uh, the to to give to give another analogy, you can think about cellulitis or other infections. Not all infections need to be tra transferred to a tertiary center, but when you have a necrotizing infection, one that is rapidly evolving before you, the patient has systemic symptoms. They would need to be uh, you need to you need to consult right away. Yeah, that's a great analogy. Um, all right, another question was, any value to make a patient count to 20 in one breath, and particularly the MIP minus the dash MEP dash FEC? You kind of I touched think, on that a bit before, but maybe if you can just uh, Dr. Dr. Cortel Blanc uh, answered that uh, very nicely. I think the breathing test is, is very useful. Uh, I actually do a lot of work in this in the outpatient setting where we're dealing with more subtle cases where we are exploring MIPS and MEPS and MG and how useful they are. But uh, as you know, the, you know, these are more challenging to do in the emergency department and even in our outpatient clinic, not easy. Also SNPs, for example. So that's why I mentioned that perhaps the FBC might be the only addition, the test you might consider. There's handheld FBCs that can be done if you're trained well on or you have access to an RT. Uh, that can be helpful with that 20 milliliters per, per kilogram kind of target. Um, but I like this, the counting test as well. I, I agree that could be a useful one. Excellent. Uh, Miguel? Uh, Dr. Perry, I just wanted to add one thing to an earlier, uh, uh, to a really good point that Dr. Casper uh, brought up about the antibodies. Uh, one thing that, um, so not, uh, not everyone in the audience here will be at a tertiary center or an academic center. And um, some of the antibodies for myasthenia um, they, depending on where you practice, they won't run them unless the patient they're ordered in the hospital. So like anti-mask antibodies at, you know, that, uh, in many, many laboratories won't run them. Uh, and that's uh, part of the reason, uh, for, like further, uh, furthering, uh, Dr. Cosper point where some of this testing might be important to do in the emergency room to avoid any delays in the patients, not getting some of these investigations done. So I, I see one more question in there on pregnancy, uh, Jeff, maybe I can answer that. Um, sure. Actually, I'm, as I mentioned, I'm at a myasthenia meeting. There's actually a number of posters actually work from our group on pregnancy and MG. So perhaps even just doing a quick PubMed search, you will see some of these recent, because have, there's not been a lot of great literature on there. So we've done our own center site, population-based information on this. And I just saw, uh, also depends on the type of antibody that you, I just saw a poster uh, half an hour ago on this. So. Um, I think the general rule, though, is that there can be some patients, typically for a lot of immune conditions, it follows a third, a third, a third. It's, it follows approximately that. So I think the bottom line is, yes, pregnancy can increase MG crisis in some cases. Uh, so something to be aware of, but not, not ubiquitously. Great. Fantastic. So I think that's most of the questions we have here. So um, at this point, I'd like to thank our uh, two presenters for their very informative talks. Uh, you've provided us with many pearls and tips for next encounters with uh, patients having these types of disorders. Uh, I'd also like to thank everyone who joined this webinar, um, the Scientific Planning Committee for their um, input, the CAPE staff for their work behind the scenes, our IT support. Um, finally, this uh, session has been accredited by both the College of Family Physicians Canada and the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons. Please don't forget to complete your evaluation forms and claim your credits. And the certificate of attendance will be mailed out by the Cape Bass staff together with the evaluation link. Um, so with that, we will um, conclude tonight's uh, webinar. Thanks again.